Hi, everyone. So glad to have you here and welcome to the Wine and Spirit Wholesalers of America's webinar, Getting Craft Brands to Market. Uh, I am Michelle Corsmo, super excited about the group that we have assembled today. They are first rate and we really are thrilled to bring you four craft brand ambassadors and the wholesalers from WSWA member companies that they work with, grow their business and connect with licensed retailers. So welcome everyone. Thank you. Thank Hello. you. Thank you. Yeah, it's good to be here. <laughs> yeah, good to be here. Uh, I know um, for all of you that are participating today, uh, each of the pairs really have great stories. They have terrific professional experience and best practices for getting to market, and also the challenges that face craft brands and wholesalers in the current and future marketplace. And today is a great time for us to talk about this to our friends at Discus and their Twitter feed. Uh, they made me aware that this is Craft Spirits Week. So what a perfect time for us to do this webinar. Uh, it's almost like we planned it, which we didn't, but let's <laughs> we did. Uh, so let me start by telling you who we have here with us today. Uh, first, we have Cheryl Dersey of LibDib. She is the founder and CEO. And Cheryl comes to us today along with Philip Raleigh, who is the Vice President of Business, Business Development at 291 Colorado Whiskey. Welcome, Cheryl and Philip. Thank you. Thanks for Thank having you. us. Uh, we have Sarah Harmelin, who is in sales and marketing with Allied Beverage. And Sarah is here today with Cass. And I know we have a picture of Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. There we go. And we have a picture of Sarah and Kat uh, Hantanas, who is with 21. See, she is the co-founder and CEO, Sarah and Kat. Terrific to have you both with us. It's good to be here, Michelle. Thanks. Thanks for having us. And last but not least, we have Drew Levinson, who is the Vice President of Business Development and Emerging Craft Brands at Breakthrough Beverage. And Drew is here today with Dave Munoz, who is VP of Sales and a partner at the Back Bar Project. And they have a fascinating uh, business model and story. So really excited to get into that. And of course, Thanks. to make sure, sorry, welcome everyone. <laughs> um, I wanna make sure to also introduce Jake Hegeman with WSWA, who is here to moderate our questions and make sure that we uh, have someone that's paying attention to all of your questions for those of you who are submitting questions through Q&A. Uh, we will get to questions from the audience uh, in the second half of the webinar and really excited to hear what, um, what you're all thinking about. So let's get into it. Uh, let me start with the craft brands represented here today. Uh, and I kind of want to go down the line and ask each of you to tell us a little bit about your product. Uh, tell us where you started, what your product is, uh, and really bring us to the point where you started working with the wholesaler uh, that's here with you today. So with that, Kat, can I start with you? Absolutely. I just want to make sure you guys are, everybody can hear me okay? We can hear you great. Perfect. Yes. Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone out there. Um, so I'm Kat, one of three female <coughs> founders of 21 Seeds Tequila. Uh, 21 Seeds is an all-natural, real fruit-infused tequila. And I, I started making it actually about eight years ago before we brought it to market. I needed to find an alternative to wine. I was having trouble metabolizing wine, um, like a lot of my girlfriends. And um, my doctor recommended I switch to Blanco Tequila, which I thought was pretty cool because he seemed like a cool doctor to recommend that I don't stop drinking <laughs> altogether. Um, but for me, you know, I drink a margarita, you know, from time to time, but to drink Blanco tequila every night instead of wine, it seemed a bit aggressive. I do have two children, so I'm sure it's warranted oftentimes, but nevertheless, thought it was a bit aggressive. So what to do to this Blanco to make it as easy to drink and delicious and smooth and smell as good and just convenient. You know, I can just pull it out of my fridge, pour it into a wine glass, some club soda, slice of citrus, as that glass of wine was. And what I decided to do, I like to cook, I infused it, and that did everything I needed it to do. It solved all of my pain points. It didn't take care of my kids screaming at me, but it solved all my other pain points. So at that point, I thought, you know what, this is awesome. I did that for years and years, and over the course of those years, I noticed a lot of my girlfriends were also switching. Uh, you know, they were coming from wine and beer, looking to drink lower carb, less sugar, you know, kind of on this wellness movement. 
um, and switching over to tequila. And they were drinking Blanco tequila and squeezing just an awful lot of lime juice in it to try to smooth it out, which to me was more like acid reflux and a nice experience. And they were finding my tequila instead. And so I was making bottles and bottles. And finally, my husband's like, go do something with this because <laughs> you're ruining our kitchen. So I decided to take a walk down the tequila aisle and say, hey, is this a business? And this was about two years ago. And sure enough, I found that there was really nothing the way that I was drinking this tequila uh, and that my friends were drinking the tequila and you know, girls, guys who cared about wellness, like they just wanted to drink lighter. There was nothing like that uh, in the tequila aisle from the way that it looked you know, that, uh, to the way that it tasted to, you know, there are all, all these tequilas that have come on the market, sort of being marketed like scotches and whiskeys and nothing like light and bright and simple and easy to use and not scary. And so at, at that point, approached my sister, who's one of my co-founders, our girlfriend, Sarika, uh, who comes from the world of CPG and said, hey, let's, you know, let's explore this further. And we went down to Mexico. We found an incredible distillery also owned by a woman and predominantly staffed by women. We didn't know it at the time. We chose it because of the quality of the product and, um, and we launched. So over the, you know, we, we came to market. We started in California because we're based in California. We started there um, about actually a year ago, almost to date, like a little over a year ago and, um, and, and just took it out to market. And at that point, um, you know, we needed to be where she shops, right? Because we had a female consumer. And so we, we, we got into BevMo, we got into grocery, you know, some smaller grocery chains and people started buying it. And, um, and we kind of were fine without a real major distributor at that point. Um, but then we started to get, you know, Whole Foods wanted to bring us in and they didn't want to deal with our, without a major distributor. So at that point we started to think about a major distributor. And again, this was in California. And then we met Sarah and Sarah changed it all for us. We fell in love. <laughs> <laughs> and that, brings, that brings us to that point. <laughs> to that That's fantastic. Can't wait to talk more about that. Uh, Dave, why don't you tell us a little of your story? Well, good morning, everyone, first of all. But, um, I'm a partner in Back Bar Project. I started with the company in 2012. I was lucky to have a partnership group that had already gone through all the startup phases of a business and finding funding and a really, really great brand in Jafar Liqueurs. I was really excited to kind of come into a company that was somewhat established, but really needed to find that distribution model. And that's when we started going out and seeking all of our commercial partnerships. Um, I coordinate between our regional sales teams, our marketing department and our operations department, trying to make us all kind of row in the same direction together and work together as a team. And we're an importer, so our model's a little bit different than the producers that are on this call, like you, like you mentioned. Uh, we focus on family-owned brands from foreign countries with some culture, some value, um, a focus on quality. Uh, like I said, we started with Jafard. We added mezcals from Oaxaca and Durango soon afterwards. Uh, now we work with tequila, Jamaican rum, and some French cognac and vermouth as well. Um, so we've got a pretty broad portfolio, but um, we start with our core brand, and that's the modifier, right? The base spirit that makes all these great new distillates and craft spirits taste great in a cocktail and add a fruit variation to a cocktail. So that's the primary point of our business. Um, and I think we're lucky. We have great commercial partnerships. And I think as this is focused on a craft brand, we work with our partnerships. So I want to thank Drew and that team from Breakthrough for really putting us in a really high mark uh, within their organization. Um, and it really was helpful to have partners like that moving forward. But it's been a fun eight years and I'm looking forward to hearing from the rest of the group too. Thanks, Dave. And I'm looking forward to our conversation about you uh, bringing that modifier into, into the mix, which I, I think is terrific and just such a great niche uh, to, to distinguish your brands uh, within your company. So Philip, uh, once again, when we first met, I love the hat. I feel like it just evokes so much warm personality, uh, which we have a lot of in this industry, but uh, love that you lead with that and really excited to hear more about uh, your spirit. Well, thank you. Can you hear me? Everything okay? We can. Um, so Distillery 291 um, was founded by Michael Myers. Uh, he was a fashion beauty photographer by trade. Um, September 11th changed his life. Um, and uh, he moved out to um, Colorado with his family at the time. Um, he was commuting back and forth for work, read an article uh, about Hendrix Gin and Cellar Jerry Rum, and he decided he wanted to create a Colorado whiskey. He wanted to make 
a big, bold, beautiful Western whiskey. And to do that, he wanted to do it from grain to barrel to bottle. Um, and so 10 years to the date later, he started his uh, distillation company. Um, three years after he had been making all the whiskey himself, um, selling it, you know, getting people to taste it, I came on board and met Michael um, and became the VP of business development here and uh, hit the ground running um, with uh, sales here in Colorado and building that. As we um, grew as a company, um, right around 2017, we had started looking for some distribution out of state. And um, right at the beginning of 2018, we had won world's best dry whiskey from Whiskey Magazine out of London, which pushed us into a whole new level of needing <laughs> distribution. Um, and we had went with a couple distribution companies and they weren't really working for us. And then actually one of my accounts brought up LibDib uh, and that's how we got to meet Cheryl and her team. And um, from that experience, um, we've been able to open up in every state as LibDib has been opening up more and more states. Uh, growing, we're in 11 states now um, since 2018 and um, just bringing independent whiskey to the market that's made grain to barrel to bottle and trying to play with the big guys. Fantastic. I love that story. Uh, so let's now go to the wholesalers and talk a little bit about how you met the partners that you're here with today. So Sarah, Kat is California based. You are New Jersey based. How did you two come together for this business venture? Oh, well, New Jersey based is a loaded question, but um, I um, actually spent 12 years in California. So, um, and but that's not how we met. We met through two different, I was referred to her exactly a year ago, um, or she, we were referred to each other, um, three mutual friends. Um, one, my friend from college had my reunion, you know, just one of those, my friend is starting a tequila company, can I introduce you? Um, and she sent me the link, and as soon as I pulled up their website, I grabbed my fellow partner in innovation and some other salespeople around me and said, look at this. Um, and that was before we smelled or tasted the juice or met the girls. Um, the second time was also through a family friend. Um, so it, we look at it as kismet and meant to be. Um, and also, as I said, I spent time in California. <coughs> Pat and I had similar backgrounds. We started off both in entertainment and just um, meeting these women that were my peers and entrepreneurial and, and trying to start something new that fits so many niches. Um, it was, again, as Kat said, we fell in love. So multiple times, uh, <laughs> it felt like it, it was meant to be, which is great. Um, right. So good to hear. So Drew, you have taught me yeah. the difference between base brands and modifier brands. Good, uh, yes. So thank you for that. You're, uh, uh -huh. you're improving my knowledge every day, which is great. <laughs> um, were you looking for a modifier? Is that how you found Dave, or was it a different story? No, it was a different story. Um, you know, a little background, uh, I've been with Breakthrough about 12 years and uh, run our Trident division, which is our division dedicated to the emerging and craft spirits portfolio within Breakthrough across our 13 markets, Canada. Um, and prior to this, this life for the last, as I said, uh, you know, more than a decade, I was at the Bellagio in Las Vegas. I ran our beverage program, including our cocktails and mixology program. So I had a, a pretty strong background in that segment of the business. And as I transitioned over to Breakthrough, I started our beverage development team, which is really focused against the on-premise and cocktail development. And, um, you know, several years in, we came across this brand, uh, Giffard Liqueur, which is um, really was, was something different. It was, um, you know, a modifier as we talked about. So it played well with all the other uh, spirits out there, the base spirits, as, as we talked about, the, the big multinationals and the craft brands as well. And, uh, you know, to make great cocktails to this point, the, the modifier or liqueurs had not evolved much in the past couple of decades. You'd had some pretty standard well pour brands that had been in, you know, the, the lower shelf of every bar for literally decades and, and not a lot had happened in this segment. And as the consumer started looking for a, a more premium style cocktail and cocktail experience. Uh, and and the, the customers, the accounts started upping their beverage and cocktail programs. They were looking for something as well. And uh, Jafard fit this perfectly and really has 
has been a, a leader in this category for the last five, six years. <clears throat> and, and we have, you know, really had a great uh, relationship with Back Bar Project going back to Las Vegas, which was the first market uh, that, that I learned about the brand in. And I've since moved to uh, Nashville. I'm Nashville based and oversee the country uh, for our program. But we have in the last several years expanded the Back Bar relationship out of Las Vegas and across our most of our network at, at this point. So it's been a great relationship and, um, you know, great people. And we love uh, working with them. So good here. I'm looking forward to going into uh, how you guys are building that up. Yep. Uh, Cheryl, let's go to you and talk a little bit about LibDib because as a wholesaler, you come at it from a non-traditional uh, perspective, which I think is really interesting for people to hear about. And then talk about how you and Philip. Uh, Absolutely. Okay, well, so LibDib, we're a wholesaler too. Um, and, you know, we're in six states now, but we do things a little bit differently. We use technology to, to connect small makers, small, we, call it, we call our suppliers makers, um, to connect the, the makers to, to accounts to do business within the three-tier system. And it's open to everyone, which is really a different way of looking at three-tier distribution when, you know, like Sarah and Drew, they've, you know, they met, they, they talked, they tasted, they went through a whole process to bring in that brand. Whereas some, you know, a small brand from anywhere in the country can go to LibDib, sign up, and once they get compliant with the right permits and, and, and colas and all the things that you need to do to be compliant, they have access to the marketplace um, through a technology platform. So, uh, you know, ultimately we're, we're different because we're open to all, like and anyone can sign up and have distribution in our six markets. We're in, you know, California, New York, Florida, Colorado, Wisconsin, Colorado, with a number of other licenses pending. My goal is to be in all 50 states. So uh, look, look forward to that someday. <laughs> and you're growing fast. And we're growing fast, yeah. And uh, we, we launched in 2017 um, with the platform. And I think we met Philip about halfway through, towards the end, a little bit towards the end of the year. Like you said, an account introduced us. Um, one of those great little craft spirits bottle shops said, hey, I need to get my 291. Can you help? And we said, absolutely. And uh, Philip signed up. And that's kind of how easy it, that's how easy it was. They signed up. They got on the platform and and they I think they made a sale within as soon as they got the right permitting and it was there you go so um, yeah so that's how how we're different and you know we've developed a relationship with Philip as he's expanded into all of our other markets with us um, and we we really enjoy working with them and it's good we we like right. to drink the whiskey too <laughs> it's great because it's really interesting to hear your story to think about how much even though you're primarily um, e-commerce based, right? Technology based, that it's still those relationships. And that's Absolutely. key in each one of the three stories that we heard was really about that connection, that relationship, either in the market or through, uh, through business friends and uh, in Sarah and Kat's case, um, through college friends, which is great. Uh, and you know, at WSWA, obviously we care a lot about being able to facilitate some of those networking opportunities and conversations which is why we're really excited about next year in Orlando. Dave and I were talking about uh, meeting face to face instead of virtually, which we will do soon. Um, uh, sorry that we to do it this year in Vegas. But for our wholesalers, uh, as you were talking about, you know, the relationships, and you talked a little bit about this, but touch more on what you're looking for in a craft brand. Uh, you know, so you get that initial conversation. Uh, what more is there, Drew? You want to start? Sure. Uh you know, obviously, <laughs> this can be a, a very challenging um, piece for many of the suppliers out there trying to understand how to bring um, value into a, a wholesaler relationship. And it's something we take a, a lot of pride in and making sure we do a very thorough uh, process. We look at every brand that, that comes across our desk, and it's something that we're constantly evaluating and and um, you know, looking for brands that bring a few different things. I, I think the number one thing I always say is that have a purpose. Uh, that the brand has to have, you know, a point of differentiation or a purpose um, and for being. Uh, and it's really hard to keep piling brands into the same category with the same kind of story. So bring your story and bring your purpose to the relationship. Um, second part is it is a relationship. It's a, uh, it's a long-term relationship. So think of it as a marriage and think of it as, A, you know, we always look for people that we want to work with, that we enjoy working with, that we think are are committed to this and, and committed to um, not only the brand, but also the growth of the brand as, as they see it. So uh, they're in this for the long term. This is not a quick in and out type process. 
you know, that they're committed to resources in the markets that they want to expand into and that they've thought about those markets ahead of time. Uh, you know, the old strategy of launching across the country, you know, simultaneously, it's become very challenging and almost impossible in this day and age. So be very specific about the markets that you want to expand to and why. And when you do that, uh, commit to those markets with people, resources, effort, understanding the markets, the nuances, and those type of things. Um, and then again, the, the last piece is, is that we need to think about this in a long-term strategy. Uh, from the wholesaler standpoint, you know, we don't look at brands as a one to two year relationship. We're, we're looking for five, maybe even 10 years down the road, oftentimes before we see true value back from a brand. Um, but we put a lot of our resources, efforts, GSMs, trainings, education uh, around the brands into the first uh, part of that relationship with the hopes that we have a long-term relationship and strategy that will bring value to everyone. So those are just some of the things and, and, you know, that we're looking for when we look at, at brands. It's interesting how that long-term relationship that you talked about really fits in the filter uh, mm -hmm. for the other decisions that you would think through that you, you mentioned at the beginning of, um, of your remarks. That's, that's yeah. fascinating. So Sarah, I know you were thinking about long-term uh, relationships with uh, 21 Seed as well. You want to talk a little bit about what you look for in brands generally? Yeah, I mean, as Drew said, um, the, I mean, the last thing he said is the biggest thing. You have to look for the potential commerciality. Um, you don't want to spend the hand-holding time. Um, you want to see the growth. You want to see the prospect. Um, and on that note, it's also, you know, I, I said that I looked at the website of 21 Seeds and kind of got it right away. Because the other things I look for are the packaging, the story, um, and then, of course, the juice. Um, but before the juice, in this case, we saw that there was a trend here with health and wellness, with infusions. We had just launched Smirnoff Zero and, Abs and, and Petal Botanicals and, and tequila. Obviously, everyone here knows that's an unstoppable trend. So combining it all with, again, these three fabulous, strong women led me, also reminds me, you need the personality behind the brand. And I think one of the key things I look at with new products after after some bumpy experiences as well, is not only are they willing to commit to the market financially and physically, but um, they need to, the brand needs to know who they are right away. I want to see it and know who they are um, and what I'm going to get. And, and we got all of that with 21 Seeds that even if they're California based, it happens to be that, you know, Pat spends some summer on, in Long Island and we, was a, we were able to meet within a couple of weeks. She was able to come in a meeting within a couple of weeks. She and her sister flew in multiple times um, and, you know, in-laws in Philadelphia too. So it was a whole, there is an East Coast connection, but they came. They made their presence known. My team knows who they are and got to develop a relationship with them. And so it was just, you know, it has to be the synergy of all those aspects. And it's interesting too, um, to think about the physical face-to-face -face meetings, which is something, Cheryl, you and Philip have talked a lot about, uh, the work that you do together. So talk about the experience at LibDib in, in your uh, pickup and relationships with your brands. Yeah, sure. I I mean, look, the cool thing about Lib is that anybody can get access to the marketplace via three tier. So again, that's very different than kind of the traditional wholesaler model. Um, and so we can kind of see what the market wants. You know, you're, you don't have those gatekeep, those traditional gatekeepers that are picking and choosing. So everyone can get to market. However, it, it's still a relationship business and it's important to have relationships with your wholesaler, whether it's LibDiv or whether it's, you know, uh, you know a breakthrough or, or an allied. Um, mm -hmm. Philip would come to town and he would work his accounts because his, they're his relationships and he would meet the team. He was like the king when he walked into our office, Philip, you know, everyone loves Philip. He's awesome. He'd always bring samples with him too, which is also great. Um, and he, you know, he really work, he works hard. And I think that's an important piece to it is you can, you can have a brand, you can have great product, you can have great packaging, but if you're not out there kind of building your relationships as a brand, you're not going to be, it's, it's just the success is, is it, that's, you know, it's a driver for success if you're out there working and, and doing the work. Um, and that's really in any wholesaler relationship. And there's no better salesperson than the brand themselves. And that's really what we enable. So yeah, Philip, I don't know if you want to add to that, but I mean, we, yeah. 
I do. I mean, I think it's your team is texting me right now and before this, like, kill it today, <laughs> have fun. Um, but I think that relationship building also, it, it comes on the maker, right? The maker has got to be the one who's out there in the market and giving as much as the distribution company yeah. is giving back. So that's the huge part of the relationship that, that I find most important with LibDeb is that we are partners. So I'm in the market just as hard as they're doing things for me. And then we can come together and brainstorm and come up with some really great projects uh, like the webinar series we did and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it really helps that not only, I'm not relying only on my distribution company, but I'm also a partner and working as hard on the market to build the relationship, not only with their accounts and their people, but uh, their team members as well. So Philip, talk a little bit about what you were looking for in a wholesaler. Well, uh, we had done uh, with a couple distribution companies and our biggest thing is we're, we're a story brand. We tell uh, Michael's story, we tell our whiskey story, we tell Colorado's story of whiskey. And sometimes it just doesn't translate with a sales rep or without lots of education. And so to be able to go in and be boots on the ground um, and uh, be able to uh, use resources from LibDib. Their technology platform is one of my favorite. I understand it. It's easy. My, my accounts understand it. It's easy. You just drop in. But then all of a sudden, that being so easy and the no pressure of you don't have to have a salesperson in your face every day. But if you need something, we're here. We have the platform. But let me at least educate you. And so I think that's what we were looking for. It's the education. Um, and then obviously those tools for our customers and our accounts um, to be able to uh, become 291 family, to become LibDib family. It's like, we're here for you, but you know, let us just tell our story and you do what you want with it. That's great. Dave, talk a little bit about why you chose the wholesalers that you're working with today. Um, it was kind of a process. I think when you start a company, you don't have a lot of sales history. So you walk in and you kind of have to write on relationships with the quality of your product to really pitch it in, especially to the larger wholesalers. Uh, we all mentioned that as a modifier, we don't compete with a lot of base spirits with Jafar. With that being our first brand that we launched, we said, let's come in and really go after a partnership with your big brands. You're forced to sell big box brands. They're on goal for your sales force all the time, but let's provide an accent to that, an additional bottle sold uh, because we're going to be the modifier that complements those brands in a cocktail. And I think that was a big selling point for us. Now that's how we kind of went through. Uh, we used some of the influencers in the organization like Breakthrough. We went to what they had a beverage development specialist. And these people are really in tune with the cocktail market and that whole cocktail movement that started when we were starting the company. And we said, hey, we want to be a part of this. And we went to them with samples and kind of guerrilla marketed back to these, these big organizations because we didn't have the same platform. So really looking at those craft teams and those beverage teams uh, at our large wholesalers was always a big opportunity for us. And then the we play well with others, I think Drew alluded to it, but oh, we yeah. definitely live on that, on that premise. Even with our base spirits, like our mezcals and our cognac, we're looking for a price point and a price position that complements their portfolio. We're not trying to compete with something that they're already trying to do. I think that really helped us when we were bringing in new products over the last eight years as well. Um, we just want to be part of that bartender toolbox and we want to give the distributor that same toolbox to sell to those, those bartenders, whether they're you know, originally bartenders in the on-premise, but now the home bar tender as being someone who needs a fruit modifier or flavor or a quality spirit to put in their drink. So that's where we really targeted. And then the last thing was the incubation strategy. Um, distributors that do it well, we looked at 40 top cocktail bars. We had a high retention rate, a high resale rate. And we said, well, let's apply those metrics to a larger base in the general market on premise. And now we're saying, how can we apply those same metrics to off premise and add on to that value as well? So really looking at like stage one, 40 cocktail bars, stage two, 100 on premise, stage three, next valuable consumer, anyone that wanna makes, makes a better drink and then off premise and really, really consumer driven stuff. And having a partner who's in line with that strategy is a big reason why we wanna work with a consistent you know, commercial partner. That's great. And it's really interesting too, to think about, um, and I love the filter of what you want out of a wholesaler that you're working with so that you've already made the determination about what uh, product set, skill set, the business tools that you uh, need your wholesaler to supplement. Uh, mm -hmm. and Philip, you talked about you want to be the guy out there selling and being that face to, to develop that story. And so the great thing about that is I hear both of you talking about what your needs were and then finding the right wholesaler to really uh, accentuate 
um, the things that you needed them to bring. So Sarah, I don't, I think Kat may have some yeah, that's what I'm just trying to, yeah. technical troubles, but uh, what kind of questions was Kat asking you when you guys came in? And we can go back to her on this too. Yeah, uh, and, we, and we ran through what she had to say the other day. As she said, um, when we first met, they had signed up with Park Street and had some significant distribution in California um, and a tiny bit in New York, mostly because uh, Kat was spending the summers in New York and um, her husband is from New York. So in the Hamptons, there had been some good press, but they didn't, so they didn't really know what to expect with a wholesaler. Um, and I came in, you know, and I kind of came in as a guru in some sense. And even though I'm relative to a lot of people new um, personally in the industry, only four years for me, but a lot longer for my lifetime, I guess. Um, but so it was really getting them comfortable with the idea of this commitment, um, especially New Jersey's a franchise state, had to explain a lot of differences between the state rules and other distributors they may have been talking to. And I think what made them very comfortable, as Kat alluded to the other day, and I, and I will say, is that um, we have a similar background. And as she said in, as we were getting on here, the background of film and television for us has made a story so important um, and understanding new media and marketing. And I got it right away and they understood that I got it right away. And especially being a female. Um, they they love the idea of a woman getting behind them and a woman who is all about supporting other women. Um, so I, you know, that for us, that, and, and again, we just clicked. So from then they've grown into other distributors and I think she's back. Um, and luckily, the next one was, uh, you know, with Solana at Young's. They really clicked, too. Which is great. Pat, I was just speaking on your behalf. Oh, my God. Thank you. Technical <laughs> difficulties. Wow. <laughs> we all are living in that exact same world. So everyone yep. is with I you. Just, take nothing of it. Okay. Uh, just a really great job um, talking about what you look for in a wholesaler, uh, which, is, which is terrific. I don't know if there's anything to add. Um, you know, I've, I missed all of that. So I might just add, um, can you guys actually hear me right now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Awesome. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, sorry if this is repetitive, um, but I just wanted to say, A, you know, we were a female founded company. So the fact that Sarah really understood that we were, we were creating this product for her by her, you know, all of our reach and marketing and every, uh, relationship that we had. And we had a lot of those relationships in online media, um, in social media. And that was really like how we were communicating with our consumer. Um, you know, all of that needed to be understood by a distributor. Like, I think traditionally, you know, you come to market, I think for most brands, like you, you know, you expose the brand in the on-premise and then you sell it in the off-premise. We were really exposing, our girl doesn't really like, she's not at a bar, like learning about a, a cocktail really, right? She's, she's ordering her drink. She's hanging out with her girlfriends or she's a mom and she's drinking at home. So for us, it's like, where does she go for discovery? She goes online for discovery. She goes to Instagram, she goes to Twitter, she goes to Facebook. That's where she's discovering brands, what to drink, what to eat, what to wear. So we needed to be getting to her there. And I, it's not my term, but I like this term. It's called like the outer premise. And that's really where we were building the brand. And the thing that impacted us so much with Sarah and her team was when we did our general sales meeting, Sean said, listen, these girls understand online media, social media, and we're, we have as much to learn from them as they have to learn from us. And I think that was like the perfect prototype for the type of distributor we needed. Someone who understood that we were different, right? We're trying to reach our girl. We know where she is, but it's not the normal path. So you got to be open to that. So they were so open to it. They embraced it and it was incredible. And I think it's been super successful because of that. Like, the nature of what we were trying to do. You know, this was a totally different product. It's an all natural real food infused mm -hmm. tequila. You know, we needed, we, we needed to be reaching her where she is. We can't expect her to go, you know, where we placed it. Like she is out there online and that's what we were really good at. And of course we, we hadn't anticipated there was gonna be this pandemic that hit. So when that happened, it made it all the better for us. But before that, yeah, so then, you know, then we don't seem, you know, that, these guys, Allied is like, back then seemed so smart, right? But now it's like, everybody's rushing to get online. So I just wanted to add that. That's great. It's always nice to work with uh, other smart women. For sure. Definitely. 
So Jake, I am seeing that we're getting a bunch of questions coming in. And the great thing about the questions is they're very specific and detailed, which I think is terrific. And so I'd like us to switch now into the Q&A part. And um, can you bring us up our first question for the group? For sure. We've had a lot of questions around communications. We've been talking uh, a lot here about, about the relationship. Uh, first question. Uh, is there such a thing as too much communication between supplier and distributor? And maybe a finer point, what's the right amount and what, what does that, that communication look like for a successful partnership? I'll turn that to, to everybody here. Jump ball. I might jump in with something right away in case I lose you guys. <laughs> I'll grab one before I lose you all. Um, what, I, what I think as a small brand, right, who you know, we got a lot of press, right? We're in a magazine this month on her list. We were in Forbes. We were on the Today Show. Those are meaningful items, right? Like pick the meaningful items and send them to your distributor to amplify through their network to retailers who can then amplify them to their customers. Like that's good information. If you're like in some local festival and you want to like let the distributor know about that, I think they're going to be inundated and it's too much. Like you have to gauge what you want to do is you want to use your distributor to amplify your message. And so it better be a good, important message. That's all I'm saying. Great. Dave, I, I feel I'll, I'll jump in here. Oh, sorry. Um, I, I, but yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, in terms of how we work with our, our makers is, you know, ultimately communicate with us you know we do a lot of digital communication so it's a lot of email um and a lot of like sharing of information we also have like a private you know facebook group for our suppliers that can go in and, and, and communicate with each other and with us and i think again it's just having this like a dialogue is important so i i hate to say limit your communications you know keep the dialogue open keep the communications open and, but make sure you're sharing relevant information, <laughs> um, <laughs> knowing that everyone's busy and has a lot to go on and, and, and all of that. I, I would uh, kind of almost say the same thing as Kat. I mean, it's, it's those big things like the Maxims, the Forbes, those big awards that are done blindly. It's, you don't want to just make noise to make noise with your distributor. Um, say like, hear me, hear me, hear me. Uh, it's part of that relationship too what you're bringing to your distributor for them to share with their team and those education tools, you, that's really what I think the partnership is. And, and like she said, it's not that every little festival that you're, you made a placement at, it's, it's those big accolades that come through that speak volumes without making a lot of noise. Yeah, and, I think I'm to, oh, touching on the same point as everyone else here, but I want to say that the quality of the communication should increase the frequency of the communication. So if you're relevant, you know who you're speaking to, you know who your audience is, and you know how to display that message, that helps you increase the frequency of communication. Of course, we should have open dialogue. And of course, I'd say the more communication, the better. But once you hit the point of noise, you've lost that value behind it. I want to say that current information right now is more important than it's ever been. Um, you know, Breakthrough had gone through a system of putting out a newsletter with all of their COVID-19 updates for their own policies, internal, external business trends, what consumers are doing, all those. And I would access that every week and it would be really exciting to see, you know, either positives or concerns <laughs> and be able to react to them. I think. So it was a really well thought out, current and very valuable communication. Sure, hit me with those all the time and we want to do the same back to you guys. So keep those lines open to make sure it's relevant. Right. And I think there's two forms here, we, you know, we're talking Kind of the the marketing and the the, the accolades and, and that communication and then there's the day-to-day -day, you know getting through the day-to-day -day operational of your business and there you have to be very smart with that as well and david hit on it you know make sure that the communication you're having with your market or your person in your market your lead that your connection there that it's valuable that you're not just you know sending noise into the system that you're bringing value in, in the communication um one of the challenges we sometimes see is we have you know, suppliers that just want to score keep communicate, you know, where they're, they they <laughs> just sit at home and tell us, you know, how much we did or didn't sell that month. And, and we know that, we, you know, that's not something we, we need, uh, you know, to tell, but bring valuable communication. Um, I'm also a big proponent of getting into some type of, um, you know, cadence with your, with your supplier or your wholesaler so that you have, you know, just a regular interaction that you understand 
you know, we're going to meet every month or we're going to talk through this every three months or we're going to do a formal sit down every six months. Whatever that is and whatever works well for you and your wholesaler, that, that's really important uh, because as we all know, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of noise in the system. And if, if we can get to a, a really well, um, you know, work well oiled or working cadence, it brings more value to the supplier and to the wholesaler both. Got it. You should also share all your wins. I think in communication, whenever you get a win in the market and you share it back to your wholesaler back and forth, or our team shares it with their team, you know, our regional salespeople, like they love hearing from the distributors yeah. when they get a huge win. I think we should always be really free to share those. Yeah. Each other. Jake, what else do you have? Well, a follow-up to that uh, related to COVID. Um, uh, in terms of accessing your retail partners, uh, what's changed in light of COVID uh, with regards to communications? I'm guessing a lot. Yeah. Um, I, well, considering we're 21 seeds and our questions got a little uh, out of sorts, and we had um, 21 seeds as a relatively new brand. I mean, we had said they launched last spring in California. We launched them in New Jersey in last August, and during COVID, we hit our first month of over a thousand cases. Um, so while it wasn't necessarily getting new placements until you know we shot out Oprah everywhere, um, and that, and it's growing every day. It was really more about making sure that the people who had already bought in and believed in it continued it. And given the nature of this product, for instance, but you know the trends that were going throughout the COVID time, um, it was easy to drink light. Um, people for so for volume easy to mix and therefore fit into this the cocktail trend the home cocktailing that we've seen and so it's just been their social media marketing base and and all that has been already meant for COVID and it was an easy transition so I think uh, a lot of the work that I do is remote with Lifted because we're in so many states together um, so what I really had to do and what 291 had to do as a team and um, uh, uh, is focus that communication and be direct with our customers. So we created a whole, um, you know, online uh, platform for our resellers, right, to keep that partnership going. Because a lot of times resellers will say, oh, you know, who carries that product again? What distribution company are you with? So we wanted to make tools that were accessible for purchasing. Um, obviously with LibDib, that's already an e-commerce site for those resellers. Um, so they were used to that, but then we had to also um, really be able to let our um, customer base know that, hey, you can get these products on the reserve bars and the caskers and the drizzly and connect that online as well. Um, Cause you had to stay in front of A, your customer, but B, you also have to support, um, you know, your liquor stores and your on-premise during this time of like, what can we do to make this easy for you and your customer to stay in front of your face? Yep. Yeah, just growing on that, Phil, Philip, the, the new world, the, the, you know, this whatever you're to go or curbside or delivery, uh, you know, piece is obviously almost, a, we're looking at it as a, a third channel. There's the on-premise, the off-premise, and then yep. whatever you want to call this new premise. And uh, certainly there's been a tremendous amount of evolution that's happened as a result of COVID. And it's happening uh, as a, as a multi-state wholesaler, we're seeing it happen at different rates. So it's a really challenging piece uh, to understand. We have certain markets that are, have, you know, I think of the Arizonas and the Floridas that have uh, been, you know, open markets and very ahead of, uh, you know, opening in, into the on-premise world. And, and pretty loose laws uh, throughout. And simultaneously, we've had other uh, markets like the DC market or, or you know, Chicago Metro, where things have opened more slowly and it's been a, uh, you know, a more resistant uh, opening. So throughout this process, we're, we're in constant um, you know, evolution phase and, and understanding this process. But we've devoted a tremendous amount of resources and we've worked, and Dave and I uh, have worked a lot to work to understand how Back Bar Project can uh, bring their brands to that forefront. Uh, their, their brands, several of them work very well in the on-premise and, and will feature well in that to-go uh, or, you know, or curbside opportunity, as well as delivery and, and making the home bartender a better bartender as Kat, Kat, you know, I think that's one of her big driving forces behind her brand is that how these people at home can be more effective. And 
uh, there's going to be a, this isn't going away. We know this is a, you know, a long term uh, segment of our industry that we're going to continually work at and, and look to develop this category. And I think that's the biggest uh, piece of this co post COVID world. I think the first reaction is we all said our on-premise business is going to be in shambles and we got really, really scared because it was such a big portion of our, of our business mm -hmm. going into COVID. I think what you had to look at was what did we do traditional that was well? Jafar always aligned to take home cocktails and large format cocktails. And we said, well, let's make some really simple recipes that impact those parts of the business. That was really helpful to have our distributors kind of preach that message to the accounts that stayed open during the to-go and delivery side of the business. And I think we shifted to, let's call up all of our big commercial partners and see what kind of relationships they have with big retailers. Uh, Drew and then RNBC Youngs has given us a lot of access to things like Amazon, who's opening up fresh and delivery and those side of their business. They've given us access to Costco and to Total Wine and More and these retailers that can help us kind of grow within the retail space and make that home bartender better. We didn't have those relationships going into this. We leaned on our commercial partners to really bring those through. Um, and I think that's been a big shift in how we've gone to marketing. Also, update all your digital content because that's the future. Yes. And make sure that's there. My business partner, Kai, is <laughs> consistently updating all of our digital content for Drizzly or online retailer or as Young's and Southern. And Breakthrough, you guys open up your digital stores now are coming down the pipeline. Uh, you want to make sure that that stuff looks really, really good going into a post-COVID environment because it's going to be really important moving forward. The last thing is we dug down some of our cocktails. We made simple two-step cocktails that really, really speak well to consumers because that's going to be a very, very important part of our market moving forward. We should do a collab, Dave. <laughs> he is a two-part cocktail. Yes. <laughs> that's right. It's all good. See, we're making business happen right here. Right here. <laughs> Connections. Love it. That's actually Love it. A, good, that's a, a good point. We did a lot of collabs. Like we... It's, I think it's, it's not enough to just, I, I think absolutely update your content, but you also, everyone's busy, right? Like everyone's slammed doing their core business. So for our retailers, our indie retailers, like, you know, we're, we're in the big, we're in the big chain accounts. That's all great. We know she's there, but she's also shopping at the local retailer, like the indie guy, because she it's, it's local. She knows him or her. It's, she knows how it's been cleaned or if it's been kept up, like you want to stay local. There's a part of it that does want to stay local and that's a really trusted person. And so now arm that person to spread your message, right? That person's slammed. So give that guy or girl who owns that independent, who's more likely to use this information, good content to blast out. Here's an easy cocktail recipe. You write the email. You write the email that's going to go out to that, that guy's entire email group. And send it to them and say, hey, I know you're busy on a Friday. Like, will you send this out? We do that all the time. And it works. And the local people who buy from that purveyor are going to read that email and actually be a much better micro influencer. Right now where you can't taste someone on your product, you have to rely on influencers, micro influencers, people that they trust to recommend things to them. Right? And I mean, that's why we're so excited about Oprah because like nobody trusts there's no cons consumers trust Oprah more than she's been telling us what to buy for 30 years, right? So we're like, Sarah, blast this out, right? Um, but it's those micro influencers, which is those local retailers who also play a key role. You just need to arm them with the content and they don't have time to make it. So make it for them, send it to them and just be nice, but pushy, you know, like every week, send one, do this, try this. How about this? One of these days you're going to get a hit. And when it happens, you get a lot of serious orders. So Jake, one of the questions that I saw in the feed that I thought was interesting was somebody talking about kind of what they hear in the marketplace on, you know, you can't go to a distributor to build brands. They don't build brands anymore. Uh, and what uh, the, the question was saying is that they're really hearing from um, the conversation that there is a long-term strategy that distributors have with the brands that they're connecting with. Um, and so the question is really, how do you, uh, for the wholesalers, um, how do you want, or what's a great way for craft and emerging brands to approach you? I think they have, you know, from us, we've had, we aren't as big as, you know, we're single state, um, so one law and, and not that, and not relatively big, but big for the state. 
But that said, it's still hard to cut through the noise and get the attention of 300 sales reps who have all these other, his, you know, history of large brands. So I think, we, like I referred to 21 Seeds, it was almost so much easier because their marketing message was done. That message was done. They were doing their part in terms of, of marketing, media, you know, PR, and all of the outreach. And they had done their research. And I think that was a difference between Kat, her sister, and Sarika before, rather than some other smaller brands that I had first met, that they had done their homework before. They mm -hmm. did not come in. They were new, but I could not have known that. I would not have known that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point, Sarah, that, you know, that have a, and I talked a little bit about it earlier, but having that point of differentiation, knowing exactly who you are as a brand, and what's your story and how that story is going to resonate and being able to convey that not just to us as the wholesaler, but through to the consumer. Um, you know, so often we get kind of put in the position that we have to be the face of the brand and we can do that to some extent, but ultimately the brands, its face, its story, its, uh, you know, ethos has to come through to the consumer. So that the consumer wants to go, and actually pull that brand off the shelf or the bartender wants to put that brand into their cocktail. And uh, you know, so often when we're talking to brands, we're trying to understand what is that pull opportunity, what is gonna differentiate them so that the consumers are going to be asking for and pulling the brand through. Uh, because, and I think Dave hit on it earlier, you know, we'll get the brand through our Trident strategy and, and Trident's really about navigating through the bigger wholesaler, uh, our division helps the smaller brands to navigate this process, you know, through the wholesaler. But once we get you out into the market and get placements in, in what Dave said, 40 key accounts, now we need to see that brand pull through. We need the story to pull uh, the brand through. And then when we get to that certain velocity, when we get to that uh, level that, that we see that happening, let's go get another 60 or 80 or 100 accounts and do the same thing. And that stair-stepping approach is a great way to build the brand. It, it uh, sets that long-term strategy and relationship and, and makes for a healthy business in the long-term. And you know, ultimately, all of these pieces that, that everyone's been talking about today is key to getting uh, you know, to that level and being successful in, in a single state or in a multi-state situation. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll add on. I mean, we're like I said, we're different. You, you know, it's mm -hmm. as easy for a brand to go to livedib.com, sign up, it's free account, and you get compliant, and you have distribution. So, and you're you're on our platform, and you can be seen by our thousands of retailers that are going to our site. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, but but again, you can you can post and pray and hope that someone finds it, or you can be like <laughs> Philip, and you can be still building your relationships still right. use, utilizing the tools that we offer. We have some great tools that while we don't have a sales force out in the street, we have a technology that provides things like automatic reorder reminders. And um, it provides, you know, warm leads for people that are using the platform and, and, and things like that. So ultimately, you know, it, it is what you put into it, but having the initial access through our platform at least allows everyone to get started. And we have, you know, brands from all sizes. We have small people who have literally just started in wholesale or folks that have holes in distribution in the states that we offer distribution in or you know larger brands that have mm -hmm. uh, innovation brands that need to get to market quickly we're the fact we're definitely the fastest route to market you can be you know in certain states you can be up and running and selling within a matter of four or five days I don't think there have to be expectations managed um yeah. Because I, I, I wouldn't tell most new, uh, new suppliers that, yeah, we'll sell a thousand cases in 10 months, uh, you know, in, hit the month of a thousand cases in, within 10, um, because that's not always the case. And so yeah. that's our job as well as, you know, for any maker or some new supplier looking to get into it, just remember that you are, if you're coming in with a gin, you're competing against Hendrix and Tanker, mm -hmm. not just other products. I think the growth in relationship uh, is really key too, because two and a half years ago when we started with LibDeb, we were targeting certain cities and certain small bottle shops and accounts. But as we've grown, we're now doing chain pitches. And so that growth, I think, uh, 
during this time of the relationship as well that we keep talking about with both um, our distributor and our accounts is that um, as you as you grow in a brand and you you commit to those areas like everyone keeps talking about it allows us to go bigger and bigger and then continue to grow and uh, you know every state that led has been opening we've been right behind them and partnering and getting things into that area so I think that that's important too that that growth relationship with your distributor and the communication with your accounts and is where that really is a big win. That's a good point. Perfect. Jake, do we have time for maybe one or two? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so this probably goes to Drew, but I think it'll uh, resonate with everybody here. Um, there were a few questions that came in about, uh, you mentioned the Trident division and having a craft mm -hmm. division within a large multi-state wholesaler. Can you talk about the similarities and, and and differences between a division, a craft division in a large multi-state distributor and let's say a craft specific single state distributor. Yep. Uh, uh, yeah, there, there's certainly some, some differences and, and we understand you know, our role and, and where we were four years ago as Breakthrough came together. It was a merger of uh, Charmer and Wurtz Beverage. And we uh, very quickly understood that we had uh, you know, 14 different states with 14 different strategies on how to handle this craft and emerging thing. And, and so what we did by building Trident uh, is we, we put a division together. It's a strategy. It's an execution arm. Oftentimes, we're the, we just help navigate uh, the larger wholesaler. It can be daunting to a small supplier to even navigate and understand who their points of contact and how to work and what the expectations are. So we play that role very, very uh, regularly. And then the, uh, you know, the last piece and most important piece is we want to be an incubator of these brands. And, uh, you know, some people have asked, you know, what is craft? What is not craft? I've asked, <clears throat> if I get 10, you know, 10 people and ask them what's craft, I get 15 different answers. So we, we've actually gone away from the terminology exclusively craft, and we're really looking for that emerging space. And you can define yourself as craft or not craft. And, that, that's fine, but what we're ultimately looking for, and I think we're all on the same page, is we're looking for brands that are emerging, incubating, growing, and, and ultimately have that future uh, growth that brings value to both. Um, so when I look at what, how Trident works inside this larger wholesaler, the benefits that I, that I tell suppliers is that um, you have kind of that hand-holding support piece, uh, you know, uh, navigating strategy uh, but you also have the resources <clears throat> and the reach of a wholesaler that can get you into, you know, a full, full market or a full state, uh, you know, distribution that uh, we have, you know, the, the resources on the street, we have the relationships and, and, and something as simple as we pay our bills, I, you know, that can get challenging for, uh, especially, we, you know, we've heard a lot of challenges during this time and, you know, money is, is uh, very important to any upstart supplier and making sure that they're getting paid. Uh, by their wholesalers. So that's, I think, the advantage that, that something like Trident can bring or this type of craft division within a larger wholesaler. Um, that being said, there is absolutely a place for those small independent wholesalers uh, to, to, you know, and the lib dibs of absolutely of the world to give those brands that are just, you know, they're just getting going a place to start because there's so many great brands out there that, and so many great stories and we want to make sure that they're all getting an opportunity to, to get into the markets, to grow through the process, uh, and ultimately graduate up through the process. Some of our best days in Trident is when we literally pass one of these small brands on to our main selling divisions. And, and we lose, quote unquote, the revenue out of my division, but we feel like we've set them up for success in the future. And, and I know that LibDiv does that frequently in their, their model. And I know that it's done by a lot of smaller wholesalers out there as well. So uh, it, it's an important piece of the growth model for any brand. Yeah, you know, I was just, just going to uh, add on to that. Oh, sorry, uh, real quick. Just going to add on to that. Like you said, I love what you said about incubating. Because when you think about craft and small production and, and getting to market, how do you, you know, allowing everybody access and incubating and it's, you know, right. you have that breakthrough Chris. We do the same thing with RNDC, who's our, our national partner, where we can take a brand, grow them, and then pass them up to, to RNDC when they're, when they're ready. And they've learned mm -hmm. and they've gotten to that point, which is important because like you said, navigating a big distributor is a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. And we do that with some of our whole small wholesaler relationships like Tenzing yeah. and, 
Illinois or Bacchus in the Mid-Atlantic. So there, it's this constant escalator of, of brands being grown throughout the, the process. So. Um, as a supplier, when you're trying to navigate the system and it's something that we really focus on, you have to be able to sell back not only your story of the brand, but remind them that there's a lot of margin in craft. We represent growth at a very high yeah. percentage rate, even though it's on a small base. But we operate with really, really high margins for both the producer, for us, and then the distributor, because there's a lot of value behind those brands. So when they're growing the bigger box brands at one and 2%, but they're making a much lower margin, we represent a slower percentage, but we also represent a lot of revenue. And I think you guys should be able to tell that story to your wholesalers as you operate within yeah. the divisions. Yeah, you represent gross profit, margin and growth rates and those three combined are very valuable to a wholesaler uh, in those those three metrics that's a great point there's been so many really fascinating uh great chunks of wisdom that have come out of this hour-long conversation so thank you to each of our panelists um, for sharing that i think the thing that was the overriding theme that i took away from this and no small surprise that it's the relationships uh, and that you should be prepared for a long-term relationship. And what that means is really you need to find the right partner for you, right? You need to find the size and shape and structure of an organization um, that's gonna fit your needs. And so that's always, that's always the challenge. Um, obviously we care, as I've mentioned a lot about the relationships at WSWA and in this virtual environment, we have been looking for a way for, uh, to help all of our craft brands that have long supported WSWA have that opportunity to get in front of distributors. And so we launched the WSWA Virtual Marketplace. And this is a showcase for all of the producers who would uh, normally have had hosted suites and booths at this year's show, uh, but a place where they can be <laughs> up there in front of our distributors. And so anybody that wants to see that, there will be a link to that that comes out uh, in an email to you right after this uh, webinar is over. Um, share that and, and certainly talk to us about uh, the possibility of being in that virtual marketplace as well. Um, and as I said, you are gonna get an email after this webinar and in there, there will be a recording. And so you can click on that and watch it. Um, certainly feel free to share that. Uh, we also have had such a high number of requests on this particular topic that we're going to be recording a series called Tips of Getting to Market, uh, videos with the, the guests that we've had here today, and we're going to make that available to all of the attendees and on our social media accounts. So look for more information from us on Tips to Getting to Market. Um, so with this and all of the other WSWA webinars that we're holding throughout the year, I hope to see you soon. Look for us on our social Media sites and other evites that come from us and for all of our WSWA members you can find it in the weekly buzz uh, and we hope to connect with you there so to all of our panelists Dave Drew Cheryl Kat Sarah and Philip really terrific to have you here and look forward to continuing the conversation thank, thank, you. thank you Michelle thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you Michelle. thanks everyone